Okay, so now I would like to introduce our instructor for today, Kathy Pere. Some of you have may had the pleasure of getting her irrigation or leak assistance at your home or business in the past with our free water checkup program. Kathy is a water resources specialist with the city of Santa Barbara, a certified irrigation auditor, a avid home gardener, and a beekeeper. Kathy, take it away. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're kind of going on a little divergent path today, going away from uh, talking about plants and irrigation, and actually now going to look specifically at what happens when you get a high water bill? What happens when you have that smooshy space outside or you hear water trickling? How in the heck can you find it? Do you have to hire a plumber right off? So my goal is to help us each identify where the leak might be, or at least isolate it down to a small space and then try and determine exactly what it is and see if it's something that you can repair yourself or if then you need to uh, bring in the big guns and get a professional out. So let's go to the next slide. The quick outline today, uh, there are specific tools and different ways to make isolating a leak much, much easier. The meter is one, the number one thing that you can just walk out, you can look at it and it will let you know whether there's water flowing onto your property. We're gonna talk about then how to specifically figure out where the water is leaking, how to narrow it down. Is it inside? Is it outside? Uh, is it in your main line? Some of these we won't be able to specifically say where it is if it's in the main line, but at least then you'll know that it's time to call in the big guns. We'll talk about a few of the real common inside culprits, those things that you can look for outside that are most likely uh, to be it, and then how you can repair it yourself or at least turn it off. And then of course, we'll have a question and answer. Next slide. So the first thing is, is you wanna be able to locate your water meter. The water meter is actually out at the curb between, if you have a sidewalk, it's in the park strip area between the street and your house. It's covered with a concrete lid and it usually has a little tiny lid that you can lift out of it so you don't have to remove the whole thing. And the best way to read it is you need to stand in the street, face your house when you're looking at the meter and then the numbers will all be um, right side up because it's designed mostly for when our staff goes out to read it, they pull it up as they're walking down the street, they look at your meter and write down what the numbers are and look and see if you have leaks. Next slide, please. So you're wondering if you have a leak. Maybe you received a door hanger that your usage was super high or you're new to the residence and you hear some gurgling, you don't know. So the best way to find out if you have a leak and to confirm that there's nothing running is to go out to your meter, pull the lid off the box, and then I usually recommend bringing a screwdriver or something to lift that little concrete lid off. Sometimes there's... I don't know, I don't like slugs. So sometimes there's slugs down in the box and I don't wanna to touch them. So you wanna use the screwdriver, lift the lid, and then there's a protective coating cover over the actual face of the meter, lift that up. And when you're looking at the face of the meter, it's gonna have a flow indicator. Most of them have a little blue snowflake, which is in the, the lower left quadrant. Some of the meters still have a little triangle which you'll either see right smack in the middle of the meter or in the left-hand quadrant. Next slide. So this is an example of, of what those leak indicators look like. And it, they don't measure volumes of water, but they do turn in response to the smallest amount. So they're very, very sensitive. You may actually wanna stand there for a minute or two and just watch and see if the point on either one of those is slowly turning clockwise. A, a small, small leak will turn very, very slow. If that's faster the spinning, the bigger the flow. Next slide. So the, the biggest question is where is the leak? So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the tool of having a 
the water meter showing us that there's actually water flowing onto the property somewhere. But you're going to want to turn off the water going into the house to eliminate any of the leaks that might be inside. The picture that you see is what it might be behind hedges or something in your front yard, but that's the emergency shutoff from the meter main water going into your house. You can identify it by that sort of a bell shaped pressure reducer. Wherever the water comes into your house, you're gonna have a pressure regulator. And most times you will have a handle like you see here, that's a ball valve and that would turn the water on or turn the water off. You may have what's called a gate valve, which is uh, the turn off that you turn as if it's a hose bib and you crank it down to turn the water off. So there will hopefully, when we're looking to the outdoors, you'll hopefully have an outdoor shut off as well. And swimming pools have a separate shut off for those. So we're gonna be able to isolate the water either to the inside of the house to the irrigation, to the swimming pool, or to the main line. Next slide. So this is kind of an example of, of what the shutoff valve looks like. On the left-hand side, that white handle is in line with the water pipe. If it's in line with the water pipe, that means water is flowing through the pipe. On the right-hand side, you see that the handle is perpendicular going across that incoming water pipe. When the handle is across the pipe, you can visualize that as being a stop. And that is how you know that the water is shut off to that fixture or to the house. Next slide. So the key is you're gonna turn off the handle, go 45 degree angle, make it perpendicular to the pipe. So you've shut off any water to the inside. You're gonna walk back out to the meter and look at the flow indicator again. If that flow indicator stopped, then that means the leak is inside the house. If it's still moving, then that means that the leak is somewhere between the meter and the shutoff or the meter and your irrigation valves. So we're gonna go inside now. Let's go to the next slide, please. So we've determined when we've shut that handle off that the leak indicator stops moving. It means that when there's pressurized water coming in the house, there's somewhere for it to escape, whether it's in a toilet, hot water heater, um, an RO unit, who knows where, but we're gonna see if we can find it out. You can't find the leak if you don't have the water on. So be sure that you turn that valve back on so that you have water flowing into the house. Next slide. All right, poll question. All what? right, we're gonna launch our poll question. And let's see, this is, what is the most common leak inside a home? And as a reminder, Kathy, the answer is a photograph answer. Got a lot of smart cookies so far. We can see the answers coming in. <laughs> I can't, it'll be a surprise to me. Yeah, I have a feeling that perhaps many folks have had this type of leak before. Yeah, it's about 90% of the leaks that we find that raise your bill up three or four units in a month or a hundred gallons or so a day. The most common leak in the house or the apartment, or the condo. We've got a clear winner. Yay. So now you know where we're gonna start looking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the answer. Ah! A little bit of bathroom humor for our webinar. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a toilet leak. So most toilet leaks, People say, oh, I would know if it's leaking, I would hear it. Well, there's two types of toilet leaks. There's the ghost flush, which yes, you can hear. You're the only one home and all of a sudden it sounds like somebody just did a little mini flush. You're like, flush, it's refilling real quick. Wait a minute, how'd that happen? Um, 
that is a leak because the water's draining out of the toilet very slowly and then it refills. So that one runs about 150 gallons a day. You can hear it so that you'll, we'll go over what things to do to look for and how to replace it. Other leaks, the one you don't hear, totally silent. We call them a silent cyclical leak because they seem to come about usually in the evening when the water pressure is a little bit higher and no one's using the toilet but it's based upon how high the water is in the tank of the toilet and it just goes straight down the drain. You don't see any evidence of the water trickling into the bowl and you don't hear it. So let's move to the next slide. For those of you who haven't um, checked out the guts of your toilet in a long time, um, they haven't changed in a bazillion years other than the float valve which if you kind of look at the toilet that's on your screen, it, that's the float valve it's, it, and it goes up and down on the stem nowadays and you can adjust it by pinching, um, pinching a little device on the wire that connects to it and you lower the float and it lowers the water. The old days you had that ball cock, it was a piece of metal with a ball on the end of it that floated and I don't know if any of you remember, my dad used to fix it by Bending it. Uh, don't advise doing that. One, they're usually really, really old and they might break. And two, they're threaded. So you bend it down and the water pressure over time pushes and pushes and eventually that the float part of it is higher than it was before you fixed it and now you have an even bigger leak. But I don't see those too often. And if you still have one of those, you probably need to uh, replace it pretty soon anyway or, or put a, a toilet from the 1990s in. So the ghost flush is a flapper issue. And the flapper issue is the rubber seal in the bottom of the toilet. And when you flush the handle, it lifts the seal up, which allows the water to escape. And the other type is a silent leak. And that has to do with the overflow tube. So if you were to take the lid off the back of the toilet, you'll see the water level all the way across. You'll see the overflow tube, which is a hollow tube in the middle of the water, the water should be an inch below the top of the tube. Many tubes will say water line on them. Let's go to the next slide. Flapper, flapper leaks are pretty easy to find. One, you either you hear the toilet doing ghost flushes. If you don't really hear it very often or it's in a back bathroom where nobody visits or the powder room, out in the garage, you can use food coloring or dye tabs, which are available at Ace Hardware or anything. And those are just blue food coloring. You put them in the tank, wait about 10 or 15 minutes, the water's gonna dissolve. And then if there is a leak under that flapper, whether it's because there's debris underneath it or that the flapper is, is old and it's warped and when it's seeding down, it's not making a good seal and the water's trickling out, you'll see blue in the bowl. You see blue in the bowl, um, usual advice is to turn the water off its wall, flush it out, remove the flapper, put it in a plastic bag, go to the hardware store and buy another one that looks just like it so that you can replace it. All right, we do have videos on how to replace the flappers and um, they're only about minute, half, two minutes long. So if you're, before you go to do a replacement, um, you might wanna visit the Save Water SB website or go to youtube.com and uh, forward slash save water SB. Next slide. This is a picture of what it looks like when the water is too high in the back of your tank. Kind of hard to imagine this, but you can sort of see the water bubbling over the top of that hollow overflow tube. You may look at your meter and you don't see it leaking. But as soon as the evening comes or you get a little bit of a pressure variance in your house, so say you did some laundry and stopped, someone flushed and now the pressure's higher because you're using less devices, that water is gonna start trickling over the edge. And if any of you remember your science classes, water molecules are very cohesive. They love to travel with friends. So when one molecule goes, it attaches and it'll just keep a stream going 24 seven you will not hear this and you won't see water in the bowl. Easily 150 to 200 gallons a day 
So if you get a, a bill at the end of the month and you look at it and you say, wow, how did I use that extra 2,500 gallons, that four HCFs of water, the first thing to look at is your toilet. So let's switch to the next slide. This is just an example of where the water level should be, but I also want you to look at the back wall of the toilet tank on this picture. Can you see the shadow? It shows that in the past, the water level was too high in this tank. And when they probably, when they put the new float valve in, they lowered the water level where it belongs and it still has evidence that it was too high at one point. So you can kind of see if you've had an issue in your tanks before. And the goal is to keep that water level at three quarters to an inch below. And most of these tubes will say water line or they'll have a little line on them. So you wanna be sure if it is too high to adjust the float valve. I flush the toilet first so that you're not pushing against the pressure. Adjust the float valve down a little bit and then wait while it refills and see where the level is. If you pushed it too far down and it's too low, that's fine. Just raise it up a little bit. You can't, you can't break it if it's not already, I guess not already broke is not the right term, but if um, you can over adjust and under adjust, customize it to be perfect for yours. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is the different varieties of float valves that you see nowadays. The most common one I see is what's called a Flowmaster and it's the one on the left-hand side. It has the black donut shaped float that goes up and down. It might have a metal L bracket that comes across, but either way, by lowering the screw going through the float valve, it's gonna lower the valve and lower the water level. The other one that you see on the right, um, that's gray and green, that one also has the little L bracket on the side and you adjust that bracket up or down to determine where the water level is. And the one on the left, it's an enclosed type of a float valve. It does have a screw in it and I am not familiar with how to adjust that one. I do see them occasionally, so I put a picture of it up there. Um, I would do, if you have one of these at home, uh, do a Google search of images and find where it is and then you can find a YouTube video that'll show you how to adjust it. Let's go to the next slide. Other culprits inside that people don't realize can be a major leak. You don't usually hear these either unless you get really close and you will not see a puddle. If you have a water softener, this is on the right hand side. Water softeners, if you have the type that you add salt or sodium potassium to, um, it will have a drain pipe so that when it regenerates and it gets rid of that saline salt that clean the filters, it has to go down the wastewater pipe. If you look on the lower right hand side, you're gonna see a little black tube. Um, I have it highlighted there. That drain usually goes down something um, like your washing machine drain that goes into the sewer or into another drain that might be a floor drain or something. But you can go up to it, you can feel it, you can pull the end and see if there's water trickling or streaming out. If there is, it's usually a washer, a small little washer that holds the pressure inside that tank that has failed and you'll need to get a water softener professional to come and replace that for you and reset the time and all. The one on the left hand side, we're looking at a full reverse osmosis drinking water filtration system. You might have just the filters. If you have just the filters, they do not have a drain. The water goes in, it's filtered, and it comes out through a spigot or through your faucet into your cup. So they do not have a drain. But if you have that little tank, that reverse osmosis tank, you are going to have a drain. And this is really hard to see. And it's even clean under their sink. But if you look at the drain on the right hand side, you're going to see a little red tube that connects into the, the inch black drain tube that goes into the uh, garbage disposal. That little red tube is actually the drain for the overflow pressure and for the highly mineralized water 
that is a wastewater discharge from the reverse osmosis. You can turn that off if you're finding that you have a leak on your meter and you've checked your toilets and it's not the toilets, you stick your head under the counter and you kind of hear it, but you don't, you can turn it off, a little plastic shut off tube on top of the tank, then go back out to the meter and see if the flow indicator stopped. If it did, then it's your reverse osmosis tank. Or you can just call the water filtration specialists and see if it's time to change your filters because you should change them every year and have them check the tank as well for um, a faulty washer or something that's holding the water in that shouldn't be leaking out regularly. A little more confusing, but I did want to talk about these because they are pretty um, prevalent throughout people's homes. Okay, next slide, please. So a lot of issues what people have when they're having leaks, little drips, faucets starting to leak, hot water tank starting to leak it's because the pressure regulator going into the house is failing. Pressure regulator is that bell-shaped brass device that's where the water comes into the house. If you, most people have a pressure regulator and it's plumbing code says to set it between 60 and 80 PSI. 60 PSI seems to be the industry standard. When they start to fail, what you'll end up with is getting pressure that's closer to 80 PSI or even 100 PSI. At the street, the pressure is usually 100 to 120, depending on, on where you live. Fixtures inside are not designed to work and hold their seals at more than 60 PSI. Pressure regulators have a lifespan of about 12 to 15 years, and myself included, I have two different house color paints on mine, which means it's probably been out there for 20 years. And just as a, a quick side story, I know it's going bad because I can hear it go when I pulled the water on. I thought, oh, I'll get to it. So of course, on a Friday night, I hear water spewing somewhere in the garage and I can't find it, but the floor is all wet. The hot water heater, water intake where the ice machine little tube is cracked because of the pressure most likely was spraying water out all over the drywall out there and we probably had a quarter of an inch of water on the floor At, luckily i know right where my shut off is i turned the water off to the house uh, stopped the leak and was able to shut off the little pet cock that feeds that water and my fingers are crossed that it holds until i can get a, a plumber here to actually repair things for me. But yes, water pressure will cause you a leak. And uh, I can attest to it personally. Next slide. There we go. I Sorry, I diverge off on my little things here. <laughs> oh, yay. Okay. Today, we have one more poll question. It's what is the best tool for isolating a leak? So select all that apply. It is a multiple choice. Now we have to think about it a little bit, but uh, when Madeline feels like she gets most of the results in, she will post the answer. Aha, yay, everybody showed up at the beginning of the workshop, but pretty much you're very, very right. Your eyes and ears and the, and the water meter. The water meter is your first clue. You can confirm that you've actually got a leak because it's moving. Your eyes and ears are how you're gonna isolate a lot of these. Sometimes you can't hear them, but especially when you're working for leaks in the outdoors, you have to look for the subtle clues. And for those of you who've had to deal with leaks outside, yeah, a shovel, you need a shovel. And for those, anybody who knows how to use a divining rod, I would love to learn. So send me an email, and teach me how to do it. I think that would be so cool. I can go get a nice Y-shaped willow stick. All right, let's go to the next slide. 
Ah, oh, the inside that we just went through, those are usually pretty darned easy. Now you can identify it, you can turn it off, look at the meter, it stops it, you know where it's at. If it's beyond your repairing, call a plumber, get a handyman, get your kids, whoever you know that can help you with it. When you get to the outside, it gets a little more complicated to try and find the leak. But we're gonna start off by isolating it, same thing. Make sure that the house is turned off and the meter's still moving, which means that the water is somewhere outdoors, potentially in the irrigation, if you have an irrigation system. You may have a backflow, which is what the picture is on this lower left-hand side. This is a protective device, a fixture that stops water if there's a mainline break from sucking water from your landscape back into your drinking water system. Uh, this happens to be a fairly good size one because I wanted you to see what it looks like. But if you have an irrigation meter, an irrigation system, it's a good chance that you actually have a backflow device. If you don't, you probably like on the left hand picture, if you look down at the bottom of the picture by the hose, you're going to see a white PVC pipe coming off of the main line to the water to the house. And then you see the ball valve, that handle. By shutting that off, I can shut off water that supplies the valves in the irrigation. So that will enable me to find out whether there's a break in the supply line going out to my valves in the irrigation. So let's go to the next slide. This is kind of your, your litmus test. Shut off the irrigation and go back out. Did the irrigation, did the valve, the little snowflake stop moving? If the answer is yes, it stopped moving, then you know that the leak is somewhere from that irrigation shutoff out into the landscape, probably up to the valves. Could be a valve that stuck open, or it could be underground somewhere, maybe um, a tree squeezed the pipe and you've got a broken pipe or a shovel hit it or something. If when you shut off the irrigation, you went back and looked at the meter and it stopped. No, it didn't stop. Sorry, I got myself off. It didn't stop. That means there's still a leak somewhere. You've got your house shut off. You've got your irrigation shut off. The only place that has pressurized water is the main line from the street to those shut off valves. There's really not a very easy way for you to find a leak. At this point, the best bet is to shut the water off at the meter and call a leak detector. They actually have acoustical instruments to where they can hook up into your water line, pump an air through, and they have listening devices, and they can specifically identify the leak is right here and it's 18 inches deep. So that's when you need to bring the, the big guns in. Okay, next slide, please. So you determined by shutting off the irrigation and that stopped the leak, that there's somewhere there's a leak in the landscape. I usually say to turn that water back on just in case it's actually spewing out somewhere and you can see it. When you're done with your site inspection and walkthrough, you're gonna to wanna to turn it off again so you don't let it run constantly. Make sure, I mean, it sounds simple, make sure all the code goods are turned completely off. Sometimes they need an extra little crank on the turn to make sure it stops. Look around your landscape. Do you see an area that's lush, it's green, it's a little mossy? Is there mulch growing up in the mulch or weeds growing up in the mulch? Is there a spot where you step and it's a little squishy? You want to actually really look closely around your irrigation valves. There's a lot of connectors and threaded joints in there that can leak. And then turn them on and see if they spew water when they come on because that's a sign that you have a faulty, a faulty valve and it's leaking regularly. So next slide, please. Just a couple of an examples. If you turn your irrigation on and you look on the left-hand side, what you see is there's no spray coming out of the sprinkler, but there is a stream of water coming from underground where the sprinkler actually attaches to the riser and it's streaming down 
And there's, if you really looked at this, when it's not on, there's moss growing there. Uh, the one in the, in the middle picture is a sprinkler that's either been kicked, um, and it also looks like the top's been hit by a lawnmower. So when it's running, you're gonna see super wet. You're gonna see a muddy area, even when it's not running. And on the far right-hand side, um, this leak has been going on for a very long time. It takes a long time, thousands and thousands of gallons before you actually see water on the surface. But if you do see water on the surface, you know that somewhere under there, there's a main supply line and it is leaking 24 seven. You need to get a professional in to try and find and to pinpoint and repair these or use your shovel um, <laughs> and then get a professional. Okay, next slide, please. In the irrigation, you got to turn it on to see it. Uh, there's always a chance for cut pipes, broken pipes, connectors that maybe had an air bubble in the PVC. The seals in the pop-up sprinklers go bad. Sometimes you just need to tighten the top of the sprinkler to stop the water. Um, nozzles get hit and then instead of spraying in a nice half circle, they go straight up in one part and turn somewhere else and they don't water where they belong. Let's go to the next slide. Valves can get stuck open. They can get debris on the inside of them. There's a little rubber seal, kind of like the toilet flapper, but in a valve, that little rubber seal is called a bonnet. And the bonnet is what, when the irrigation shuts off, it slams down shut and doesn't allow the water to flow through. Most times, if you're noting that out in your irrigation, it's always a little wet around the the sprinkler heads, even when the irrigation's been off, it means that your an irrigation valve either has debris in it or it's warped and it's not closing down completely. You will see water running through your meter as a constant, very small leak. And you, it's difficult to find which of the valves it actually is. I would ask your gardener, um, some of the valves have a shutoff that you can crank them all the way down and see if that stops it. The biggest way if it's debris for a valve is to turn the valve on and off manually or use your controller. And if it's a little bit of gook or a PVC from a repair, it should wash it out. And then when the valve shuts, it should shut and seal completely and you won't see the movement on your meter anymore. Next slide. Oh, and of course, this is what I just said, valves get stuck open. The other issue that I find um, with the valves is if they're getting stuck open, you turn it on and off, it stops the leak, but it happens again. It's probably just that that rubber bonnet, that seal is getting old and it doesn't have the flexibility. The recommendation is just replace it. Replace either the bonnet or just change the whole valve. Controllers not re retaining their schedule is another really big reason for an incredibly high water bill. Many of the older controllers used a nine volt battery uh, to remember the programming when the power went out. And if you don't change that every year, the clock will go to a default watering schedule, which waters 10 minutes every day, every station at midnight. It'll double your water bill or triple your water bill. Next slide. If your irrigation is scheduled incorrectly, you basically just have a scheduled waste of water. So you wanna do a quick review. You'll look for duplicate start times. That seems to be very common. Multiple programs that have the same stations on them. So you're watering it more frequently than you anticipated. And then of course, if it's springtime and it's not 90 degrees out and it's got a little bit of rain, you don't need to water as much as you were watering in August. Turn the run times down. You can learn how to adjust it, how to give yourself a custom schedule. What a good time for a basic to start by going to our, our website. We have a, a calculator called the watering calculator, landscape water calculator. And then we also talked about this pretty much in depth at our sprinkler timer class. And, and that is also available for you to review at your convenience. New slide. 
and this is one of the the latest in programs that we have available on, in a partnership with the Flume Rebate Program and the California Water Efficiency uh, programs that are out there. This Flume device is something that you can attach onto your meter with no plumbing, no cutting into tools. It uses a rubber strap and it enables you to use your Wi-Fi and a phone app to track your water usage down to the minute. You, you can set up on the app um, leak alerts for when, how much water you want to go through before it alerts you. Say you have water running for three hours, it'll say, hey, you've had water running for three hours on your app. And um, it is available. We have a rebate going for it for City of Santa Barbara water customers. For those of you who aren't City of Santa Barbara water customers, it is available for purchase on Amazon or anywhere that you shop for these kind of things. But visit, uh, excuse me, theflumewater.com forward slash SB as a city customer. Otherwise, look up Flume and read about how it works. It might be something that's super helpful just for you at your house as well. Next slide. And going on right now, we have our annual WaterWise Garden Contest. So if you have a beautiful WaterWise front yard, we'd love for you to apply for our garden contest. We enter the winners for the city of Santa Barbara. We'll go into a countywide WaterWise Garden Contest and we'll be awarded a grand prize. Do you need, need to apply by April 30th and to get all the details and how to enter all this information online, visit waterwisesb.org forward slash garden contest. This is my favorite one to judge. I love seeing what people have done in their yards. So new, new slide, please. And you don't wanna miss the next WaterWise Native Plants uh, Lunch and Learn, which is the WaterWise Native Plants and I will be a participant in that one because I'm not a specialist in native plants as much as I would like to be. So it's um, on Wednesday, April 28th, and we'll have a guest teacher uh, who will be ready to, I think as if from the Santa Barbara Botanic Gardens, I think, but it's gonna be a great little class uh, from Waterwise Native Plants. And Madeline, if, if you have any more info on that one, you can certainly share it. Yeah, so we're partnering with the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, and they're going to talk about different recommended ground covers, annuals, shrubs, vines, trees, etc. that they recommend for home gardens in Santa Barbara. And um, it'll be a great class. We have a great booklet that we've worked with them. Uh, I think that was two or three years ago to create a nice booklet about waterwise native plants that are best for Santa Barbara gardens. So it's expanding on that. 